guess who's black in the house? Ah, 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 ah. I know, I've been gone a minute, I know. I'm gonna be on a weight work consistent schedule now. Depression is a mother. October and November were real hard for me and I still managed to put out a 40 minute vid. It wasn't 40 minutes, but it was almost. But anyway, right, I should do my intro. <laughs> Hi and welcome slash welcome back to my channel. My name is Khadija, your favorite internet play auntie or just a internet play auntie. Hello to all my returning nieces, nephews, and nibblings. If you're new, feel free to check out the vibe, suss out the vibe, whatever I usually say, take a look around. I sit on my floor, talk about whatever I want. Usually it's like commentary videos, but also video essays. Those seem to be the things that I'm into the most these days. So I don't have a fancy, fancy intro for y'all because this video was a lot of research. So I'm just gonna say that we should just get into this. This is going to be a video essay on digital blackface. I was introduced to this term a few months back and when I first heard it, I was really excited. And then I started doing research for it and I was like, Khadija, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. <laughs> but either way, the excitement outweighed the <sighs> so. We're gonna talk about blackface minstrelsy, how it's evolved in Canada and the US, cause Canada y'all ain't slick, y'all be out, y'all were out here, okay? I'm coming for your memes, your reaction gifts, stan Twitter language, I'm coming for all of it, okay? But I do just wanna say that when I'm doing these video essays or coming for anyone, I'm simply just trying to give you a perspective that maybe you haven't considered and just make an informative video that's fun and educational for all. And if it don't apply, let it fly. Digital blackface. Digital blackface. Digital blackface. Digital blackface. So the term digital blackface originated from American journalist Adam Clayton Powell III. Ooh, that's a name. Adam Clayton Powell III. I can't, Adam Clayton Powell III. Hmm. He coined the term back in 1999 and it was actually called high tech blackface. And that was to refer to stereotyping in video games, but, Feminist writer Lauren Michelle Jackson came along and did what black girls do. She tweaked it up and popularized the term in her 2017 op-ed for Teen Vogue titled, We Need to Talk About Digital Blackface and Reaction Gifts. So according to Jackson, digital blackface is a practice of white and non-black people making anonymous claims to a black identity through contemporary technological mediums. And can be used to describe the various types of minstrel performance that's become available in the cyberspace. Jackson uses reaction GIFs as a primary focus for her article. And in a paper by Aaron Wong, an undergraduate from Berkeley, the kids are all right, her paper titled Digital Blackface, How 21st Century Internet Language Reinforces Racism. She cites GIFs, memes, and keyboard stickers as the most prominent displays of digital blackface. I say all of those are accurate. I mean, look at your most used GIFs or memes and see how many of them feature black people, especially black women and black femme queer men. Was that syntax weird? Queer femme black men. I feel like I did that. <laughs> For the purposes of this video essay, however, I'm also gonna throw in Stan Twitter language and the you sorry incorrect use of AAVE on the internet because I think those things as well as reaction gifts and memes contribute to the stereotyping, further racializing, and commodification of blackness. I'm coming for you. But listen, you know she loves an origin story, so let's talk about where all this started. No, not there. Even further back. How would you like to go to work for me? Yeah, ma'am. How much you gonna pay me, I hope? Well, let's see now. Mm -hmm. I'll pay you all your work. No, ma'am. I gotta have some money. Now, for those of you that are unfamiliar with blackface, it's a performance style that originated in Europe within their theatrical productions, specifically in plays like Othello. Farewell, the plumed troops and the big wars that make ambition virtue. There's no exact pinpoint of the first ever person to put on blackface, but according to the historians, it was a centuries old tradition in Europe. Blackface made its way to the States in the 19th century when European immigrants brought the genre over, but it was popularized 
by T.D. Rice, AKA the father of minstrelsy. So according to NPR's 1619 podcast, the story goes that around the 1830s, T.D. Rice was an anonymous nobody actor, their words, not mine, but also mine. Kim, he made, he, he, Kim, okay, Kim. He was touring the country with a troupe of actors and happened upon an old black man cleaning a horse on the property of a white man named Crow. Now, something you should know, and I think I've mentioned this in a previous video, is that up until this point, Americans didn't have an art form that was distinctly theirs. Things like opera buffa, opera seria, French grand opera getting its rise in the 1820s, and the plays of Shakespeare and other famous European writers were just that. They were all in Europe. So, Rice, allegedly, hears what this man is singing and sees an opportunity. So he goes back to the theater, melts some cork, rubs it on his face, painting it black, and he performs this song that he heard from the old black horse groomer. He gives the song lyrics and names himself Jim Crow. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. So in the 1830s, this becomes a bop. Like all the white people are like, Jim Crow, I fucks with the vision, Jim Crow, this is hilarious, this is incredible, this is iconic, we stand, blackface minstrel <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You have to laugh, this is crazy, what? Uh, anyway, the man gets 20 encores and thus an era of racist theatrical performance was born. Now, there are some key elements integral to the success and just overall foundation of blackface minstrelsy that reveal themselves in more nuanced ways in digital blackface. So let's talk about a few. Psych, did y'all think I was gonna talk about blackface and not bring up Canada? <laughs> y'all funny. So a thing you should know about me is that, and I think I've mentioned this in videos before, but I grew up in the States. I lived there for the first 15 years of my life and then moved to Canada. So I've lived here in Canada for about 12 years. And a thing that I have noticed is that we have a really hard time acknowledging anti-black racism and just the fact that racism is prevalent here anyway. We like to think that we're not as bad as the States because it's not as overt here, but you can't really say that because I mean, listen, just ask an indigenous person, just, just ask. Just ask, you know, and see, see if they feel the same way. Mm. In an article titled The Complicated History of Canadian Blackface, Ryerson's assistant professor at the School of Creative Industries, Cheryl Thompson, spent five years researching this history and letting y'all know just how integral blackface was to Canada's entertainment industry. So how it begins is simply that in the 1840s, touring American circuses came to Canada and brought blackface with them, like the Europeans did a decade earlier. By 1849, when the Royal Lyceum Theater, is it Lyceum? Lyceum, 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 L-Y-C-E-U-M. When that theater opened in Toronto, it became the primary venue for performances of blackface minstrelsy. So the Lyceum Theater burnt down in 1874, but that just left room for the Grand Opera House and the Royal Opera House to become theaters of record for professional blackface in the city. At the turn of the 20th century, those American circuses that would come to Canada always made sure to stop in Toronto because Toronto audiences preferred American blackface to British blackface. <sighs> it's y'all city, I just live here. Thompson states that the typical audiences for these shows were the city's Anglo elite, and that since they all sat on the same boards and went to the same schools, blackface became the dominant part of the Anglo elite culture in the city. A distinction Thompson made in this article that I really appreciated was addressing the nuance of white immigrants to Canada donning blackface. She talks about how blackface enabled immigrants to move from immigrant other to full citizen. And it makes sense. If you're the new kid in town and everyone's shitting on a person, you're gonna participate in shitting on that person as well, just to fit in with everyone else. Except in this example, it's white folks mocking and ridiculing black folks in such extremes as to fully strip us of our humanity and other white folks who are immigrants to this land joining in to feel more Canadian. And take a look at that. 
Blackface was so a part of Canadian entertainment culture that white immigrants felt like they needed to participate in the further dehumanizing of black people to feel Canadian. Just take that in. In the US, a lot of blackface performers were working class Irishmen. In Montreal, for example, their Jewish library contains an extensive collection of photos and playbills from blackface minstrel shows put on by the Young Men's Hebrew Association. As Thompson states, at its core, the minstrel show was about maintaining both a real and imagined line between who belonged and who did not belong to the national identity. So these are just a few more photos that I found whilst I was doing my, whilst, <laughs> while I was doing my research for this. And I wanted to actually point out that this man right here, coming up, this one, he is the composer of the Canadian National Anthem. But guess what, y'all? Years before he composed the National Anthem, he was out here touring with American minstrelsy troops all over North America. Mm. Oh, Canada, indeed. I also just want to add that it's not like Black Canadians were just sitting here thinking, yeah, this is fine. In Toronto, when blackface first started popping off, its Black citizens would petition the city every year to prohibit these acts, but city council would straight up reject their pleas to censor these racist depictions. So even when Black people were fighting against this in real time, our voices, yet again, were unheard because we weren't a part of the national identity. We weren't seen as humans in the way that those white people saw each other as humans. On that depressing note, let's talk about some elements of blackface that make it ripe for the digital landscape. Oh, it feels so good to finally audition for a show for all black writers. Yes, number one thug, number one, yeah. drug dealer number two. We got characters with names, backstories, multiple dimensions. Hey, you know what that sounds like, right? Progress. Hey, girl, hey, what up, what up? What's this character's backstory? He's a drug dealer who's pursuing a rap career, but he's lazy about it. It's super authentic, though. <laughs> I went down to old Rock Show Chicken and Waffle with my boy Jamal, and we were like, let's break rob this joint. You know what I'm saying? Quack, 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 quack. Now, in order to talk about how digital blackface has made a seamless transition from the minstrel shows of the 19th and 20th century to y'all's favorite Needy Leaks memes. I said what I said. We need to take a look at the different archetypes found in blackface minstrelsy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage. Our first stereotypical depiction of a black person. Comparable. The, <laughs> the legendary. The legendary. Jim Crow. I'm sorry, I can't. Good evening, read the room. This is serious, this is serious. Before T.D. Rice decided to change his name and, you know, become the father of minstrelsy, Jim Crow came from the tradition of folk tales brought over from West Africa. In these tales, trickster animals, typically crows or buzzards, who seemed foolish, always managed to get what they wanted through luck and cleverness. Adopted in the human form, slaves would use Jim Crow as a way to avoid certain work by pretending to be dumb. They wouldn't use Jim Crow, they'd like enact it. That's a better way to put that, I guess. Enact that stereotype. So, Jim Crow, is a dumb, dumb black guy. Fun fact, in 1838, the Boston Post reported that at the time, the two most famous characters in the world were Queen Victoria and Jim Crow. Again, fuck you, Dee Dee Rice. <laughs> Next, we have Zip Coon. This character was first performed by George Dixon in 1834 and basically made fun of free blacks. Even when they can learn to read, write, and pay for their own freedom and contribute to society, they're still not human. Zip Coon was what some might call uppity. He dressed in sophisticated clothing and mistakenly used big words or puns that undermined his perceived intelligence. We must internalize the flatulation of the matter by transmitting the effervescence of the Indonesian proximity in order to further segregate the crux of my venereal infection. Next, we have Mammy. She's wise, she's big, she's fiercely independent, and she doesn't take back talk. She's also asexual, I guess, which probably has to do with the fierce independence. See, strong black woman who don't need no man. And now we have Uncle Tom. 
He's gentle, he's religious, he's sober, he cares more about white folks' well-being than his own people, and he makes rice. That's Uncle Ben. Why do y'all need black people selling you rice? I don't under, okay, whatever. Next, we have Buck. No, I'm not talking about an adult male deer. I'm talking about a person. He is big, loud, menacing, and loves white women. Hey, where are the white women at? Next up is the Jezebel, or the wedge. She's a temptress. You tell me who you want done, and I'll do the hell out of you. Sexually voracious, the complete opposite of a well-mannered Victorian white woman. This one is also interesting because on the stage, it was typically played by a man, and there's a lot to talk about. Masculize, masculizing? That's not a word, but like, you know. Men playing black women a lot of times. There's, ooh, there's a lot to talk about there. Ooh, ooh. Now we can't forget about team light-skinned. Aisha, it's for you, girl. <laughs> She's a real person. She's a real person. Hi, girl. Hey. <laughs> we gotta talk about the tragic mulatta. She could possibly pass for white, but only had a desire to get ahead and be with a white man. The only way she could be redeemed? by listening to the one drop rule and accepting the fact that her ass was black and therefore not human. And then we have the Piccaninny slash Sambo. The Piccaninny is a stock child character that's most associated with blackface. She has wild unkempt hair, red lips, and is always eating watermelon. Sambo doesn't really fit into that, but kind of. I wanted to bring up all of these stereotypes before diving all the way into their evolution as digital blackface because to me it's important to know where these things came from so we can better understand how they then evolved. So now that we have all the backstory we need, huh, let's talk about the internet. Yeah man, I think Rich was beautiful because he's got good brains. <laughs> Violence them. They used to play at Robinson, and Nick would just come in like a little kid and take the ball from him and do some crazy act and leave. If that boy ever take it serious, he'd be great. But he was a clown then. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <sighs> the internet. Because we're dealing with codes and screens and not seeing each other face to face, especially this year. We use memes, GIFs, and now TikToks to express our emotions instead of actually feeling our emotions. Think about it. How many times do you react to someone's message? Oh my god, oh my fucking god, I'm literally dying right now. I'm deceased, I can't stop laughing. And you're literally typing like this. It's okay, we all do it. But when we think about digital blackface, we have to consider the racial implications of offloading our emotions onto memes or GIFs. White people and non-black folks using black gifts and memes to express their emotions becomes a way of outsourcing their emotional labor on black bodies and contributes to what American literary critic Sian Nye calls the animatedness of black folks, AKA seeing black people as hyperbolically emotional and expressive, particularly black women. Yeah, I'm staring at you, how? And feminine queer black men. Ooh, no she did not. Sweet baby Jesus. That's how I should have said it at the beginning. Oof, I'm tired y'all, sorry. And it wouldn't be such an issue or something to critique if some of the folks using black folks to express their feelings would also be the same ones standing up for black folks in the streets. Megan McCain, I'm looking at you, girl. I mean, I can't believe I'm living in a society where it's okay to call for violence against police officers. I, I do think at this point we need to ask whether or not Black Lives Matter is a hate group. Now, in terms of internet equivalences, I'm not gonna go down the list of all the stereotypes and make an equivalent for every single one. I gotta go to bed, but I was gonna pick out a few and just do some case studies. Sound good? Now, these are not going to be exact replications of their 19th century counterparts, just interesting similarities. Let's look at Nick Young and Coyote Iwumi as our first examples. So people typically use this gif slash meme to display confusion or ignorance in something just not making sense. And I know no one using this meme is thinking Nick Young is stupid. Well, maybe Iggy Azalea is thinking that, but... But no one else using this meme or gif is trying to say, look at this dumb black guy, ha ha ha. But 
A lot of people don't actually know who Nick Young is, especially if you don't watch sports. So his image gets reduced to and becomes synonymous with the human actions of playing dumb or being confused or just looking stupid. Just like Jim Crow stood in as a personification of uh... Now let's look at Coyote Iwumi's roll safe meme. I really hope I'm saying his name right. I'm pretty sure I am. Usually when people use this, it's to try to seem like they're outwitting something or someone or to just appear like they're smarter than they actually are. There's a false wisdom portrayed here and the audience is in on the joke, but the source of the joke, in this case the meme, isn't. That may seem like a convoluted way to explain that, but the roll safe meme is to me a direct descendant of Zip Coon. Put your seven out Jim. What's that? Man, that's a period. That shows you that that's as far as I'm going with that seven. Iwumi, Iwumi, Iwumi. He is a real person, but his image has taken on a life of its own. And as a result, it's not so much him, but the caricature of him. In 2017, the most popular way for Americans to express their happiness, according to Giphy, was this. And sadness was this. Now those don't look like Mammy, but I get a wise, independent, black woman vibe from both of them. And Oprah has been memed and gifted 10 Ways to Sunday as a representation of wisdom, relaxation, enthusiasm, or colorful expression, as Mammy was always given. But actually, Iyama might fit better into this Mammy meme because I think people outside of the black circles might not actually be as familiar with her, so it's easier for them to turn her personhood into something like this. That, that you let a penis penetrate your friendship. Okay, I'm gonna do one more because we have to talk about Mariah Carey. Mariah's memes, in the ways that I've seen them, are used and are synonymous with being shady, wealthy, or being shady because she's wealthier and prettier than you. And like, I don't think Mariah Carey is a tragic mulatta because yeah, she's pretty, she's wealthy, and she shades you without trying. Does she seem cool? <laughs> I don't know her. <laughs> but the image of her on these gifts and memes turns her into some uppity light-skinned woman who looks light enough to pass and seems like she just cares about getting ahead. Now me mentioning a few gif and meme equivalents to menstrualcy stereotypes was not me trying to say that every time you use Nick Young's face you're calling black guys dumb. Again, the whole purpose of this video is to provide some context, give you some history, and some things to consider to help you better critique the world around you. <sighs> I feel like I always have to say that because the message kind of gets lost sometimes, you know? And you know, if we're not aware of a problem, how can we fix it? Come on. The whole reason blackface is still able to exist in the digital sphere is predicated on its malleability. Non-black folks walking around with shoe polish on their face for Halloween is always going to get a negative reaction for most people, especially in the 21st century. But non-black folks using certain gifts and memes that unconsciously perpetuate black stereotypes on the gram is simply going to get an LOL. I just think we should be a bit more mindful of it is all I'm saying. Good morning, TPS students. It is testing week and it's time to slay all day. Yeet! Stay woke, be on fleek, and get that Gucci breakfast. Goals! Say bye, Felicia, to that testing stress. Weather's gonna be turnt, right, Chris? Yes! Toledo weather gonna be v lit during testing week. A hundo P chance of success. You got this, kids. So back in 1986, computers had a jive filter that would translate white speak into jive talk, basically a parody of AAVE or African American Vernacular English. I'll explain what that is in a second. These days, we don't have jive filters, but we do have Twitter and just social media in general. On almost all social media platforms, you have so many non-black folks using AAVE just incorrectly. And there's a direct lineage of this misuse and mocking of AAVE from minstrelsy. You got to prove that to me. I'm a man, why can't I prove it to you? Writer Manuel Arturo Abreu calls this internet misuse of AAVE imagined black English. It's a perception of what black folks, specifically black Americans, sound like, and not an actual, fully realized understanding of the linguistic structures of a dialect like AAVE. Now let's explain what that is. So AAVE is an American dialect recognized by most linguists. 
it has its own vocabulary and phonology. It's thought to have two possible origins. One, where it diverted from English, because in the simplest way to explain this, languages change when groups of people speaking those languages separate. Kind of like how the Latin languages, languages, the Latin language has changed into French, Spanish, Italian, as a few examples. During slavery, slaves would have spent more time talking to each other than to their white slave owners, and as a result, they formed their own dialect of English. The other possible origin of AAVE is that it's actually a hybrid of many African languages and English. And I can kind of see that because in a place like Gambia, where my family's from, people will speak Aku, and some people call that pidgin or broken English. And that's kind of like a variation you could kind of see, not necessarily, but. Slaves being brought from Africa most likely wouldn't have spoken English. And if they're mainly talking to each other and not the white people while still learning English, it makes sense that that dialect would change. I was actually in a class for this program that I'm in where the speaker was talking to us about the Negro spiritual and brought up the fact that a lot of black people didn't have access to healthcare or any benefits in the antebellum South. And so if you don't have dental care, let's say as an example, you're gonna pronounce words differently. That kind of contributes to the phonology of AAVE in a way, or at least I think it does. I don't know if that's true, but I, I, I think it could, you know? Also, there's Nakia Smith, who has been talking about Black American Sign Language and how that has evolved over time. I'm gonna post the video below if y'all haven't seen it. It's very fascinating. I knew nothing about that, but mm -hmm, that's all a little dialect too, okay, come on. So, since AAVE is a mostly recognized dialect, there are certain rules used when speaking it, such as the deletion of certain words, the use of double negatives to reinforce each other, and the habitual B. Now where this fits into digital blackface is that people on Twitter, for example, tend to misuse AAVE all the time in an attempt to sound cool or up to date with the latest slang. I mean, y'all be deleting words at random and putting the habitual B everywhere thinking that you sound like this. Excuse me, homie, I'm just front, no disrespect. When you really sound like this. If homeboy is coming through with these, right. it's quiet. Yeah, no, right. it's quiet for him. Jordan's homeboy is gonna like, get it. And for the millionth time, AAVE is a dialect, not slang. But when you have things like linguistic subordination, as Abrero points out, using AAVE is seen as using a dialect comprised of people with lower intelligence. Elaborating on this, he talks about how there's this two-ness at play in white America's treatment of black English. It's cool currency in youth culture, but it's also bad English. Ebonics to me was the dumbest idea ever. Foo was a way of saying, you silly young man. What are you talking about, Willis? What's up? Why y'all in my sh was a way of saying, cease and desist. And I hate to say this, but a lot of y'all, myself included at times, internalize this duality of coolness and bad grammar. The way I talk around other black people and white people I trust is very different from the way that I talk in professional spaces. And that's because I've been told in so many covert and overt ways that using AAVE is a sign that you weren't smart enough to learn how to speak proper grammar or speak proper English. It's just code switching. An example of this is because I grew up in Georgia, I would actually always say ax instead of ask. And I remember getting made fun of for the way I said it by a white person. And I consciously made an effort to stop saying ax and say ask. And I only noticed it because my older siblings still say ax because they still have a bit more of an accent than I do. It, is interesting. Now let's look at Stan Twitter language, for example. A lot of the words and phrases used under the umbrella Stan Twitter language was slash is created by trans queer people of color and our Southern black aunties and grandmas. I've been at the balls with the legendary children. Would it seem ignorant if I slapped the taste out of your mouth? And the miscontextualization of AAVE. So this constant misuse of AAVE slash black queer slang in general contributes to this linguistic minstrelsy because under the anonymity of the internet, you can try on blackness in this linguistic form. This dialect and its subsequent slang become repurposed, decontextualized, and redistributed into the popular white sphere. Popular straight white sphere, popular straight sphere, all of the spheres. And as Abreu puts it, deracialized and decontextualized these redefined words enter the mainstream lexicon at an accelerated rate due to the internet and their proliferation among white standard English speakers 
prompts exhaustion. So after a while, you have people who have no clue where this language came from, becoming sick of it because of its misrepresented overuse and trying to claim some authority on banishing the language from our lexicon, which has to be one of white supremacy's many unrecognized seats and speak to the disposability of non-white slash non-cis queer POCs and black women in general, because this language and its slang wasn't yours to begin with. You took it, didn't use it correctly, and then got sick of it and decided that because it doesn't fit into or didn't come from white standard English, it has no value. Side note, I talked about this a bit in my cancel culture video, uh, mentioning where cancel culture came from and the, the actual term canceled and how so many people are sick of that term now, but it's from New Jack City and love and hip hop New York and black, <laughs> black Twitter, like, Anyway, check it out if you want to, if you have the time and mental space. This video is gonna be seven million years long, so good luck. I finally just wanna say that I may be sounding dramatic relating black imagined English as a direct lineage of blackface minstrelsy, but white supremacy, you ain't gonna gaslight me no more. That was an example of using double negatives to reinforce each other. <laughs> this performance of AAVE on the internet and it's eerily reminiscent vibe of minstrel shows isn't just problematic because white performers were misusing the language they heard. It's the fact that at the inception of blackface minstrelsy, black people weren't seen as people. We were seen as property. So anything black people owned, including the words that came out of their mouths, didn't even belong to them. They, in every meaning of the word, belonged to white people and white folks could and did do whatever they wanted with anything black people tried to create for themselves and then made money off of it. So I spent seven different ways to Sunday in this video essay talking about how digital blackface contributes to the commodification of blackness. But I wanna really spell that out and explain that concept through something called the culture industry. But first let's explain what a commodity is because I find when you hear these words over and over again, their meanings start to lose value. A commodity is a raw material or mass produced unspecialized product. A commodity is a thing. And these things produced on a mass scale for all to consume find new ways of infecting our psyches when technology is involved, which is all the time now. In Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer's book, Dialectic of Enlightenment, <sighs> I hate academics. They coined the term culture industry which explains how commercial producers of mass culture use technology to justify the production of consumer products for culture and leisure, which infects everything with sameness. Now in English, that means that the lizard elites sell us products on a mass scale and use technology to justify the selling of these products under the guise of societal enjoyment and advancement for all, or at least on an individual level, mostly. it's. It's almost exclusively, capitalism is almost exclusively about the individual. Arderno and Horkheimer go on to state that, technology allows for wider and more intense blanketing of images and messages similar to advertising and propaganda. So this infection of sameness shows up through our social media platforms. And advertising and propaganda indoctrinate us further making us believe that we need to have X thing or look X way to enjoy life slash advance ourselves within the culture, then that becomes our only goal. Going further with that though, having media producers constantly pushing out goods through technology that makes its consumers believe they have to have X thing to feel fulfilled and consumers blindly taking those products in without thought of consequence creates, as Aaron Wong says, a cycle of production and consumption that easily allows for toxic messaging to flourish among consumers because they become obsessed with the latest products without realizing how unethical or harmful those products may be. Or in the case of digital blackface, how harmful or unethical the constant stereotyping and racialized animation of black people and our emotions might be. Yo, Cassandra, I said what's good, third period. What's your name? Well, my name is Natasha, but everybody be calling me Tasha. All of these factors contribute to establishing a 
prime environment for blackface to thrive. According to scholar Kevin Brin, this culture industry also thrives by selling back to the public its own worst feelings and desires. In the context of digital blackface, our own worst feelings and desires are rooted in a white supremacist value system because the internet is a digital reflection of the systems of oppression that exist in the real world because human beings are using it. In these gifts and memes, black people are not people, they're performers. And if that performance is entertaining to white folks, it's then taken in by them and circulated as their own invention. Deracialized, decontextualized for all to mindlessly enjoy without consideration of the effects or understanding of its origins. But we'll talk about white plagiarism another time. In the digital black sphere, under a culture industry, blackness itself becomes a commodity removed from its original source and redistributed as an object for everyone to pass around like cards. Our identities are stereotyped, mocked, and circulated through social media, further perpetuating white supremacy and contributing to the sameness of our modern internet culture. Y'all, when I wrote that, I was like, bitch, are you a scholar? <laughs> Hello? So I've been seeing this question a lot on social media, and I think it's really relevant. What would America be like if we loved black people as much as we love black culture? Oh. Oh, Lord. So what have we learned today? I got a hot take type metaphor thing for y'all. The screens that you're using to type these misuse phrases and slang words and pop in all these memes and gifs in are the burnt cork and grease of the 21st century. No one's, well, some people are still putting on blackface, but none of y'all necessarily are putting on blackface, but you're using Imagine Black English and memes and gifs of black people to express yourself. And I'm not here to say what your intentions are or that any of this is even malicious. I'm just saying that it's important to be mindful of the fact that you can scream Black Lives Matter in one minute and perform blackness on your socials the next. And it's the performance of that blackness, however harmless, that should be considered with more mindfulness, particularly when you don't live in black skin. And just like menstrual performers would remove their makeup after a performance and go back to the luxury of their non-black existence, you too can turn off your screen or log off your social media and go back to the luxury of your own non-black existence. And I mean, blackness is not something you can own. I mean, y'all tried and since slavery has ended, it seems like white supremacy needs to own black bodies in some way, shape or form slash just be entitled to everything black people create for themselves because, you know, systems of oppression like white supremacy and patriarchy tell you take it you own everything everything is yours in all honesty when i was writing this essay i got nervous because i didn't want it to seem like i was coming on here trying to tell everyone now you can't use memes and gifts man 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 like because that's not what i'm saying not even a little bit i'm just wanting y'all and myself included to think about the larger implications of the things that we mindlessly consume and participate in like you can use memes of black people to express how you're feeling and have some fun and, you know, sure, but consider if you're also advocating for black lives off the internet. You can partake in your TikTok dances and stand Twitter language, but also contemplate where this culture that you love so much comes from. Remember that there are real people behind the fads we all participate in and most times if a black person is the source of that fad, they don't get to reap the rewards of that TikTok. With all this research on digital blackface, it had me considering a lot of stuff that I hadn't even thought about, even as a black woman. So I'm never trying to come on here like judging y'all or ridiculing anyone for the things that you do or participate in. My goal and hope with this video and this channel in general is that, you know, it can be a place or space where people can come and learn and reflect and consider a perspective that they maybe haven't heard before. I probably said this at the beginning of the video, but I just like to reiterate it because I talk too much. I wanna provide history and context at what I think is an introductory level and, you know, ask myself and anyone who watches my videos to look deeper at things 
at all the things we consume and how we participate in the world. So yeah, thank you so, so much for making it to the end of this if you did. Um, if you did, comment below and put like, figure out a way to put the word teacup into uh, your comment so that I know you watched it. I also just really wanna apologize for being so inconsistent lately. October and November were really rough months for me and you know, mental health is real and I just, I needed to just sort myself out. I still managed to do the patriarchy video, but I, it was, it was hard to get that one out, I'm not gonna lie. But I am very excited. I've been planning out some stuff for the new year. I'm really excited for the videos that I'm getting ready for for January and February. And yeah, so, you know, if you haven't already, subscribe, like, you know, if you feel, if the spirit moves you, do it. If not, maybe next time, but you know, give me some love. Give me some comments either way and let me know what you thought. Let me know if you learned anything or if you have anything to teach me. I love that, I always love that. Feed your pets, water your plants, put lotion on. If the person you like is not texting you back, you don't need them. If they can't respond to a message, you know, maybe they're busy, maybe they're suffering through their own thing, give them the benefit of the doubt, but only for so long and then move on to someone that wants to talk to you, okay? That was unsolicited advice, it just came to my spirit, but I felt like I needed to say it. Thank you again so much for watching and remember you can always change your mind because you can. Okay, I'm gonna take my own advice and go drink some water because I have a headache. I will catch y'all in the next one. Bye.